Um, it's always a lot of fun to come to Oregon. I really enjoy it. It's, it's different enough, but it's close enough that I kind of feel like I know where I am. And uh, the drive up here yesterday was just extraordinary, going past Mount Shasta with a coated in snow and little clouds drifting by. And it was a really what I call a National Geographic moment. So first of all, I'd just like to point out uh, where Mendocino and Lake County's are, just in case you don't know. Um, how many of you have been to Lake or Mendocino counties before? All right, so most of you do now. So um, I know that there's probably a point around here somewhere. There we go. Yeah, there's San Francisco. If we go north, here's the crown jewels of wine growing in California, Mendocino Lake, Napa, Sonoma. And uh, we're about 200, uh, 100 miles north on Highway 101. You cross the Golden Gate and you head north, and there you are. And Lake County is immediately next door. I kind of like this map better. It's, it's, a, it's a relief map, and it kind of shows you it's, there's not a lot of flat spaces in Mendocino County. So over here is Ukiah, where I live. This is where the bulk of our wine grapes are. And then over here is Anderson Valley, and Anderson Valley is uh, uh, a cool region because it opens to the Pacific Ocean, so it's uh, primarily Pinot Noir, and uh, it, it's kind of like the Willamette Valley, only better because you can actually get four tons of fruit instead of two tons of fruit, and you get paid about the same, so it's a lot better uh, deal in terms of wine growing. So Mendocino County, we call ourselves America's greenest wine growing region uh, because we have the most organic and biodynamic acres in, in the state percentage wise. We have a highly variable climate and it's all about going from west to east as I'll show you. We have five generations of wine growers, so we've been at this a long time. So we go all the way back, the first grapes were planted uh, in the 1860s. Actually, from what I understand, the same thing happened here. Peter Britt was supposed to have had a vineyard. And it's a beautiful environment. It really is a lovely place to live. We're probably best known for the little town of Mendocino, uh, which is right on the coast. And you can't grow grapes there because it's too cold. So it'd be kind of like Gold Beach. You know, it's the sort of same sort of thing. You're not going to be growing grapes there. So we have essentially two wine growing regions. One is a warm one, and one is a cool one. So Ukiah Valley and, and the uh, headwaters of the Russian River uh, are pretty warm, uh, pretty similar actually, maybe a little bit warmer than here in Medford. And then Anderson Valley, as I talked about before, is cooler. So it opens the Pacific Ocean, has more fog, and uh, that's Pinot Noir country and other varieties that like, a lot of Alsatian varieties, things that like coolness. About two thirds of our land is actually covered with forests and of course the redwood trees, that's no exaggeration, and that's a has been photoshopped, that's real. And uh, you know we, we have the remnants of a timber industry. The, the big corporate guys came and cut hard in the, the late 20th century. And uh, when there wasn't any inventory left, they split. The, uh, they restocked everything. So eventually, we'll be able to cut again. But mm -hmm. timber once ruled, and it doesn't anymore. Actually, the wine industry makes considerably more money now for Mendocino County than timber does. But the days of Georgia Pacific and Louisiana Pacific are kind of over. This is what it looked like when white people first showed up there in the uh, 1800s. And um, again, this isn't Photoshop, this is real. Those are some pretty big trees. And, and uh, when San Francisco burned up in the earthquake in 1906, Mendocino supplied a lot of the redwood that rebuilt it. This is looking south of the town of uh, Mendocino about 1890. And uh, this is all steam powered. But this was a big lumber mill that was right down along the beach. And uh, they were cutting the, the timber near the coast and, and floating it or, or bringing it in by train to the, the mills. And they would load everything up in these little dog hole schooners. They'd hold about 100 tons of cargo at a time. So it's the equivalent of about four truckloads of, of lumber. They could load up and they'd take off for San Francisco. And it was about a, a day and a half trip to get down there. And uh, before they had lighthouses, a lot of the boats perished at sea, crashing into rocks and things. And that's why there were so many lighthouses along the coast of California, because we really needed it for commerce. There were no roads in and out. So in the olden days, Mendocino was, was pretty independent. Uh, and if you, when they finally did get roads, it would take about two and a half days by wagon to get to San Francisco. So uh, we've always lived kind of in the shadows of San Francisco. In some ways, we've always been distant and, and isolated. 
As they cleared uh, some of the ground, they started to farm a little bit because the logging camps needed to eat. And Italian growers came in and they would say, what's wrong with this picture? Well, there's no grapes. There's no wine. So you can't be an Italian without wine. So they started planting vineyards. And this is one of the oldest ones. This was planted in 1877 uh, to Zinfandel. It's one of our heritage vineyards. And uh, it's called the Chapusi uh, Ranch. It's uh, actually the fruit goes into a program from uh, Kendall Jackson. And it's still producing about a ton, ton and a half per acre. These are very old vines. You know they're old when you can see through them. But it just shows you how long we've been in the business in Mendocino County. Um, I'm sure a lot of those wines weren't really wonderful that they used to make, but um, none of, I'll get to that in a second. So here's another one. This is a, another fairly old vineyard planting in 1906 called the Duprat uh, vineyard. And if you grow Zinfandel, this is a clone that a lot of people really like a lot. It's, uh, uh, it's, been, it's clean because it's on its own roots. There's no viruses in it and it's isolated. And uh, it's one of our, our really um, special places to visit and to uh, enjoy wine from. So the, these are the Italians. They, they uh, didn't have a lot. A lot of them came from Piemonte and, and Tuscany. They were really northern Italian that came there. And they loved coming to Mendocino because it re, uh, reminded them of home. They bought property that was up in Benchlands. Off in the distance, they could see the snow on top of the uh, Yala Bali wilderness, which wasn't too far away. And uh, they were happy, and they became Americans. And um, these are some of their first customers. They weren't making wine for Robert Parker. They, they were making wine for guys like this. Whole neighborhoods would come up from San Francisco, and they would stay at a guest ranch and uh, 50 cents a day for, for uh, the bed and 50 cents a day for wine and, and food. And, and uh, you can see they just recycled containers and they were kind of volume drinkers. They weren't very fussy about it. And winemaking in the olden days was, was pretty much a race between uh, drinking it and having it turned into vinegar. Uh, we, we had about 20 wineries before Prohibition. And the, the local, you know, Anglo-Americans also kind of caught on to wine, and very early on everybody was drinking wine and, uh, and brandy, and it was uh, popular almost immediately. So this is kind of a map of Mendocino County showing our Appalachian. So there, again, Anderson Valley makes up a big segment, and then we just call this Mendocino. That's our other Appalachian. There's, and there's a third one called Mendocino County. But Mendocino is very inclusive because it, there's a couple of areas to the north. There's uh, Potter Valley and and Redwood Valley, and then this, then down in the south is uh, Hopland, which is close to where I live. And you know, the whole thing about Appalachians is that um, you you really you want to think big rather than small. And I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes. So just a little bit about what are, what drives our climate. So we're on the coast, just like you are uh, here in Oregon. And uh, the fog comes in on almost a daily basis uh, most of the time because the interface between the cold Pacific and the warm land mass creates water vapor to condense uh, at night. And it's all about how far you are from, from the ocean as to what kind of a climate you get. So when we look at, at uh, Philo, which is kind of the north end of the Anderson Valley, uh, we're 14 miles from the Pacific and we have a, a Winkler region one and two depending upon where you are, so it's pretty cool. And then we're moving up uh, Valley to Boonville. And here we see we're two, maybe low region three. You're all familiar with Winkler regions, I assume. That's kind of the standard. It's just a degree summation of trying to figure out. It's a good first pass about whether an area is suitable or not for, for growing grapes. But then we go to, uh, to Yorkville. Uh, we're moving inland, and you can see we're kind of a low region two, high region, or low region three, rather, high, high region two. Ukiah and Hopland, we're in, inland more now, 27, 31 miles. And then we're at region three. Big Valley and Lake County, 38 miles in from the Pacific. It's a high region two right along the lake because we've gained some elevation. So we've gone up from about 500 feet in Ukiah to almost 1,300 feet in Lake County. And uh, then the Red Hills area, which is on close to the lake, but a little bit higher ground, that's a high region three. And finally, High Valley, we can get as a low region four. And again, we keep moving away from the ocean. There's less and less influence of the fog, and that's what makes our climate. And I think the same thing is going on here, too. The, the more inland you come, the drier it's getting, the warmer it's getting, and uh, then you get to, uh, more choices on grapes. 
Point Arena is kind of, we're, we're standing on the edge of a vineyard, it's called Manchester Ridge, and we're looking down here at Point Arena, and, and Point Arena is quite lovely, very windy, and this is where the lighthouse is, and this is actually where the San Andreas Fault goes out into the ocean, and uh, continues on up to uh, hit the Mendocino Triangle, which you're going to hear a little bit more about, uh, where the Cascadian Pacific and North American plates come together. So this is a very active geological region. This is one of the most unstable geological regions in the world. And we're, we're kind of in the middle of it, and you're on it, and you're going to hear more about that when Scott speaks. So here we are, Anderson Valley. This is our, our natural air conditioner. Anderson Valley is about 10 degrees cooler on the average day than Ukiah is, so it'll be 85 over there and in 95 where we are. And the, the fog is pretty typical in the morning, usually burns off by 10. And a really wonderful place for going Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. The difference of it between, uh, say, the Willamette Valley is that, A, I, I think, first of all, we're further south, so we're getting a little more sunshine, and it allows us to put on a larger crop. And that's really key, because I, I know that it's a struggle in the Willamette Valley to get your fruit ripe some seasons, where it's pretty rare that we have that kind of issue in Anderson Valley. Mendocino Ridge is a really interesting appellation because in order to be in it, you have to be at least 1,200 foot elevation, so we call it islands in the sky. And uh, there's not a lot of vineyards up there, but that's where the Duprat and, uh, uh, Vineyard and the Trapusi Vineyard are. And you can see the fog, this is about the height that the fog gets, is about 1,200 feet, so if you're above it, you're in the Appalachian, and it's near the coast. Most of it's within about 10 miles of the coast. And it's in a thermal inversion, so in the fall, it stays pretty warm. In the spring, it's cool. And the whole ripening pattern is very, very different than down on the valley floor. So here we can actually ripen things like Zinfandel, whereas if we're down on the valley floor, uh, the fruit's going to rot because it's too humid and it doesn't get warm enough. We've crossed over the hills now. Uh, the Mendocino Mountains separate us from the coast, and now we're getting down to the Ukiah Valley in Hopland. And uh, you know we're, we're starting to get into an area that's flatter. Here's the Russian River. Everybody gets confused because they, when they think of Russian River, they think of Sonoma County. Well, it was a classic example of how Mendocino was asleep at the switch again, not paying attention, because they never should have been allowed to have a, a, an appellation called Russian River and just have this very south end of the river where it's in the fog zone. So most of the time, they're like Anderson Valley. They're not like the rest of the Russian River, which goes up through Sonoma County. It's actually quite warm. But we're the headwaters where, where most of the water comes from. We were a lot of uh, Chardonnay. There's a lot of flat ground that once was planted to pears and to hops. Uh, and uh, the hops industry left in 1955. The pear industry is still leaving. There's a little bit left. But uh, it also grows really wonderful Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc. Chardonnay is our biggest variety in Mendocino County. Here's the little town of Old Hopland. And this is the Valley Oaks Ranch. This was once owned by a hops grower called the Haas family, which maybe you've heard of before if you're uh, anyone knows about hops. They're, they're a really big family. And I live right about over there in the notch on the Russian River, and it's a really lovely place. I'm not going to get really involved in this, but it wouldn't be a true UC uh, talk if I didn't include some data. So uh, we, we can see that our, our big variety is Chardonnay at about 4,500 acres. Uh, Pinot Noir is kind of next, but 2,500. Cabernet Sauvignon, 2,400. Zen. Anyway, you add it all up, there's about 18,000 acres, and we produce about 55,000 tons per year. Um, and we typically turn out crops that are somewhere between about 60 and $80 million a year for, for grapes. Lake County is right over the hill from us. Uh, the Mayakama Mountains separate us, and Lake County, of course, Clear Lake is the big center, and there's the Olabali Wilderness in the background covered with snow. And uh, it's supposed to be one of the best bass fishing lakes in the United States. Are there any bass fishermen in the audience? They have all kinds of tourneys there, and uh, the tournaments are really famous for how much fish they catch and how much Bud Light they drink. They're not wine drinkers. We try to think about some cross-marketing, but they're, they're a loser group for us. Um, and uh, Mount Kanakdai here in the distance, a dormant volcano that blew its top about 10,000 years ago, created some really interesting soils because of it and a lot of people come up for water sports. So if we look at the, uh, the Appalachians, most of the uh, grape growing is around the lake and the rest of it's kind of wilderness. The uh, principal Appalachians are Clear Lake, which is 
um, valleys, kind of big valley here in Upper Lake. And then there's the Red Hills area, which is volcanic soil south of Mount Kanaktai. And then a little bit north, there's another place called High Valley that's also volcanic. It's a very lovely lake, but it's, it's kind of an interesting culture. They're sort of a rough and ready bunch, so there's all sorts of, you know, there's a kind of friendly rivalry going on between Mendocino and Lake County. So, uh, you know, Mendocino County decided that their official uh, kind of slogan is Lake County, arrive on vacation, leave on probation. <laughs> and uh, and uh, in Lake County, they say things like, well, I wanted to go to the hearing last week, but my salmon suit was at the dry cleaner, so I couldn't show up to protest whatever X, Y, and Z was going on. So uh, that's how we kind of view each other, and I get to be in the middle of it all because I work in both places, and really it's uh, very nice people in both locations. Lake County is famous for Sauvignon Blanc. It really is, I think, some of the best Sauvignon Blanc on the West Coast, particularly in California. Uh, there's something special. The soils are high in magnesium, and uh, Chardonnay doesn't grow very well there, but Sauvignon Blanc just sucks it up and really does exceptionally well. And I hardly ever see magnesium or potassium, or potassium deficiencies rather on Sauvignon Blanc, whereas if you try to grow Chardonnay in those, those soils, they just can't take up the potassium to really ripen a crop properly. The Red Hill, Hills area, uh, again, volcanic soils, and we see that uh, uh, red wine grapes grow extremely well here. We have an old saying, if chocolate milk comes from brown cows, then red wine must come from red soils. And these weathered sandstones and volcanic soils that turn so red really do make some really wonderful wine. This is planted very heavily to Cabernet. And then here's High Valley, again, that red soil, volcanic soils. There's a, a lot of evidence of of volcanics that have gone on there because that's part of the continental overthrust zone where the Pacific Plate and the North American Plate came together and things sort of blew up as they slid and collided uh, somewhere between 70 and 30 million years ago. And, uh, these are, and th this actually is fairly recent uh, volca volcanism, so these probably happened within the last two to 300,000 years. Here's uh, Lake County's top varieties. They're smaller acreage than us. While we're around 16,000 acres, they're probably, well, actually close to 18,000. They're about 8,000 acres. And uh, Cabernet Sauvignon is their big one at 3,500 acres. And uh, Chardonnay would be, you know, there, but small. But Sauvignon Blanc's right behind it. So it's really kind of those are the two main varieties are Sauvignon Blanc <laughs> and uh, Cab. And their total crop value is quite a bit less than Mendocino at about 21 million, so it's a much smaller county. Put it in perspective in terms of size, so if we put Lake and Mendocino County together, we have about the same land area as the state of Connecticut. And uh, Connecticut has four and a half million people, and we have collectively about 140,000. So we actually have a people density about the same as a lot of the Great Basin Desert between Winnemucca and Elko. Uh, and so it's not a highly populated area. And seriously, if you wanted to walk away from it all, you could walk up to the ridge behind my house and head north and go to Canada and probably not see anybody if you really wanted to. You could skirt your way around. It's a pretty wild country. So what are the similarities between us? Well, both regions are part of the Klamath bioregion. So there's actually sort of an ecological tie to us in terms of the flora and fauna. Uh, if the state of Jefferson existed, both regions would probably be in it. So we have a lot of the, the same kind of, uh, you know, alienation from, from the state capital that uh, <laughs> different state capitals have the same alienation going on just because we're, you know, we're out there and we're, we're sort of ignored a little bit because unless we're creating some sort of problem that the state needs to deal with, in our case it's mostly marijuana growing, um, we, we get ignored. And we're both historic pear growing areas. So uh, we were famous for, for Bartlett pears, and uh, up here it was probably more winter pears, but the point is that they're both regions that grow pears because there's some similar soil types and certainly climate. Now I'm going to kind of switch gears and talk a little bit about what makes a region successful. So here I kind of turn off the University of California switch and I talk a little bit more about Glenn McGordy's own personal opinions from Having been involved with trying to help Mendocino and Lake County promote themselves for, uh, since about 1991, and I've been through a lot of different initiatives and a lot of different programs, and I'm making some observations about the things that I see. Uh, first of all, you need to have good fruit and good wine. If you don't start with that, then there's no sense in even bothering, because there's so many regions that make really, really good wine. 
you want to be sure that you're in there, that, that you're a contender. And uh, if you're a winery, how many winery people do we have in the audience today? How many winemakers or producers? Uh, if you want to be sure what you're offering is in, in the running. I really admire what the Pinot Noir producers of Oregon did was that they decided to put together a conference where they could get together and take their worst wine and talk about it, the, the Steamboat Conference, and they said, don't bring good wine, bring the bad wine, we'll taste it and we'll figure out what's wrong with it so that we can move ourselves forward. And that was such an amazing and difficult collaboration for them, uh, but so essential because when Oregon started with the Pinot Noir model, they couldn't have chosen a more <coughs> difficult thing to work with. Uh, it was not easy. Uh, it's a finicky grape, it's difficult to grow, and the fact that they've enjoyed such success with it is extraordinary, but I'm not here to praise Northern Oregon because you're in Southern Oregon, okay? But, but uh, learn from their example. You know, do have peer tastings, do get together, uh, use consulting enologists, uh, you know, have some tough love. Bring in somebody who's a really good winemaker and have them sit down and taste wine with you. Uh, you can do a blind tasting or you can be open about it, but talk about the wines and keep the discussion going because if you don't taste wine together and you don't strive to improve what you're doing, um, it's going to work against you in the long run. So good wineries are essential too. You have to have people who really know how to make wine. We're blessed in our region that we do have some very, very good wineries. Uh, we have some that are also not so good, but uh, I think that the, the bar is being raised every year. So, uh, you know, we, we raised uh, people who are famous in our area, GoldenEye for Pinot Noir, Steel Wines in Lake County for, for a wide array of stuff. Their Chardonnay and Zinfandels are particularly good. Graziano is all focused on um, Italian varieties, uh, mostly. And Navarro does Alsatian and Pinot. Parducci is just an old standard, and John Parducci who passed away some years ago, uh, was really a, a great person to know. And we talked a lot about wine, and I learned a lot from him. And then Bonterra, who is owned by Fetzer, uh, is famous for their organic and biodynamic wines. And they are one of the largest organic wine producers in the United States. So the first question you really have to ask yourself, what is it that your region does well? So the fewer varieties you grow, it's the easier it is to message. So that's why Napa and Anderson Valley and Willamette Valley sort of have a plus in a way because they've decided early on they're going to specialize. And specializing has a lot of advantages. When you're only doing one or two things, you're going to do them really, really well. When you have 10 varieties coming into your winery, come on. You know, you can't possibly do everything right every time. Uh, so it's, it's really great if you can specialize. And, and that's when, when Gold and I showed up uh, in 1997 and Dan Duckhorn and their first winemaker we're sitting down looking at the property with me. Um, Dan said, what do you think of the property? And I said, well, it's a beautiful property. This is Rolling Hills in Anderson Valley. And I said, the question I have for you, do you think you can make good wine here? And he goes, oh, yeah, we're going to make good wine here because we're only going to do one thing. We're just going to do Pinot Noir. So we're not going to be distracted by Gewurz Terminer and Chardonnay and all those other things. We're just going to do Pinot. So of course it's going to be good because when you only do one thing, you really, really get to uh, understand it well. You know, diversity is also interesting, and I, and I think that's one of the things that um, you have to stress for this region, much as we do for inland Ukiah is that, and Mendocino County, is that we're not re limited to just one thing. It's an adventure to go wine tasting because you're going to get the opportunity to taste a lot of different stuff. So Southern Oregon is Pinot Noir and much more. Uh, so that's one of the things that you want to remember as you're messaging your area. Okay, so how important are Appalachians? Bigger is better. You know, the, you know, people totally get Oregon. They totally get California. They might get Napa Valley. Even that they don't get so clearly. So, I mean, I, uh, I, all, our family also has fruit down in Paso Robles. And, and uh, you know, somebody was telling me they were on one of these road trips pouring wine. And someone came up and said, so what part of Napa Valley is Paso Robles in? <laughs> and, you know, that was kind of a woo. <laughs> but it is true that and when, when you get outside of your area, People probably really don't care if it's the Illinois Valley or the Applegate Valley or the Rogue Valley. <laughs> they, they may not get all that, but they'll certainly get Southern Oregon, and they'll certainly get Oregon. And the good news is that you do market your place as Oregon, and, and also uh, you know, the wines coming from the north are good. And I think Oregon overall has a pretty positive image uh, in the marketplace. 
The other important thing is that people have gotten used to the idea if they're going to buy wine from Oregon, it's probably going to be expensive. And that's a good thing, because uh, I liken Oregon and California to New Zealand and Australia. So in New Zealand, they've always had export markets, and they figured out early Granny Smith apples at $40 a box is a really good thing to export. It's not good to export at $12 a box, but $40 a box is good. And it's the same thing with their wine industry. They decided if we're going to do Sauvignon Blanc, we've got to get some money for it because we, we can't compete on the cheap levels. The cost of goods is high here. Uh, on the other hand, Australia and California have the same sort of race to the bottom. Their, their idea is a cheap wine market. It's dominated by very large uh, corporations that want to sell wine very inexpensively, but do a large, large volume with a small margin. And consequently, it, it really puts the squeeze on everybody for pricing. Uh, it is hard to distribute wine anyway, but um, we're seeing this really being a problem for middle-sized wineries in California that are doing 100,000 to 300,000 cases. The marketplace is just really brutal to try to get a fair price for good wine. So what's your market message? Do you have a particular variety, a pricing, quality, uniqueness, or other? What is it about your region that's special? For Mendocino County, we talk a lot about uh, the fact that we're a very green region, so we have very environmentally friendly uh, production, which rings true with some consumers and others could care less. Uh, you know, where we find that, that people care is when we're selling to restaurants that are really kind of uh, emphasizing high quality food, they like the idea of organic and biodynamic wine. Oregon is also a big biodynamic wine producer. There's a lot of biodynamic wineries uh, in the Willamette Valley, and there's a few down here. And the, uh, uh, the interest in, in producing high quality, environmentally friendly, safe to eat food is, is high, you know, particularly with millennials. There may be other things that, uh, that you can also message. So high quality is something I think that the Willamette Valley has done a good job with. NAM has done an extraordinary job with. Uh, they've convinced people that they need to pay a lot of money for their wine. So who speaks for you? What is the message? Do you have a clear, consistent message about your region? This is a discussion that you have to have. Um, it probably should be a facilitated discussion. Farmers don't really like to talk about themselves. I mean, you know, they're, they're not, we kind of, that's one of the biggest problems in Mendocino County. If anybody stands up and starts talking, you know, sort of boastingly about themselves or what they do, the rest of us pick things up and start throwing it at them because we don't like that. It's just not considered socially acceptable. But in the marketing world, you know, you have to build your brand. So uh, switching just really briefly to politics, obviously someone like Donald Trump is a very good brand builder. Uh, you may not like his message, but he certainly is not afraid to state it. Um, other people who have been successful? Well, Robert Mondavi, again, a lot of people in Napa Valley didn't like him, but uh, he certainly helped put Napa Valley on the, on the map. He had a very clear message. He uh, was a promoter to the end. I don't think he actually made a lot of wine, but he certainly knew how to promote a brand, and uh, his brand was Mondavi wine, and it was also Napa Valley, and it was Cabernet Sauvignon, and he put all those things together and uh, went after a model of winemaking that was based on French winemaking and was very, very successful at it. Over here we have Randall Graham and uh, the beginning of the Roan Rangers. And Randall Graham was, as he said, he's the champion of the ugly duckling varieties that nobody else cares about. So that's why I kind of have a friendship with him because I think most of California is a Mediterranean climate and uh, you're part of that too. It's, it's a warm region where, where uh, we're much further south than you, so we're at latitude 39 degrees, so if you follow that around the, the globe, you end up coming out in Sicily and Athens. And if we look at the kind of plants that grow in, in our region, most of the really good garden plants are from the Mediterranean, and that's my background. I came up through environmental horticulture, teaching at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo in the environmental hort department. And I noticed all the really good plants that we like to grow in our landscapes come from the Mediterranean area, so it sort of makes sense we should look at Mediterranean wine grapes. So uh, that's why things like uh, Sangiovese, Syrah, Viognier, Marsan, Roussan, uh, the list goes on and on. We have a lot of choices besides just Cabernet and, and uh, Chardonnay, uh, and I, I kind of like to have diverse offerings, and I, I can see that's happening here as well, which I think is great. So messages are important, even if it's something like that. Drink these French wines before you die. Um, there, there are some of these, what I call trophy wines, that 
I'll probably never drink. Even though I've been to Burgundy three or four times, I'll probably never get to drink any uh, Domaine de la Romani Conti at $1,500 a bottle because uh, I don't travel in those crowds. Promotional organizations are very, very important. They're expensive to fund and operate. And this is the hardest thing for farmers to get their minds around is doing public relations. It doesn't make sense. I mean, it makes sense to pay $50,000 for a tractor. It doesn't make sense to put people on an airplane to go sell in a marketplace for $50,000, at least not to farmers. It makes perfect sense to anybody who's involved with, with running a successful brand. They'll tell you that their cost of marketing runs about somewhere between 15 to 25% uh, per year, depending upon what you're doing to get uh, that sales force out there and to uh, build your brand image. Farmers have a really hard time with this. The other things that I found is that it takes at least a million dollars a year to have a successful organization to, to do any kind of marketing program that's going to get attention. First of all, you have to have a really good executive director. They don't come cheap. You're probably not going to get anybody good for under at least $100,000 a year to come to work for your organization. Then you have to have money for promotions and you have to have support staff. So if you don't have at least a million dollar organization, it's really hard to get uh, any traction. So um, these are some of the organizations that I work with, so uh, Mendocino Wine Growers, it's a volunteer organization. They have a budget of about 200000 a year. Lake County Wine Grape is actually a wine grape commission, so they have to pay an assessment on fruit. Or they're about a $300,000 a year organization. Anderson Valley Wine Growers Association, pretty small budget, around 100000 really great volunteers, but uh, again, limited what they can do. Lake County Winery Association is very, very small, only about probably $50,000, very limited what they're capable of doing. And Visit Mendocino County is actually uh, an organization that's funded by the travel occupancy tax, which is tax on hotel rooms. And they also have some business improvement districts, and they actually raise a fair amount of money. They're bringing in about a million and a half, and they do have some impact. Wine writers, are they absolutely necessary? I have a real problem with wine writers, and the reason is because the organization I work with is objective. We're, our goal is to take research-based information and disseminate it to uh, people to learn. Wine writers are subjective, okay? So they have their tastes, they taste through things, and then they make pronouncements. And I find that, find that they do more harm than they do good. First of all, because a lot of what they have to say is not repeatable. Uh, you know, in other words, they don't sit down and they don't taste through wine and they can't pick out the same wine and evaluate it the same way every time. So it just happens to depend upon the mood they're in, who they're with, uh, what the occasion is. And then on top of it, um, the, there's this whole other issue of they now expect to be flown in by private jet, plop down in a, you know, a gorgeous tasting room in Napa Valley and have you know, 50 wines laid out in front of them, which they <coughs> score and they go home and write about. And, and that's their gig. And it's kind of like, wait a minute. You know, why would we trust somebody like that with such a valuable, uh, important message to convey to the public? And I, I just have real issues with them. On top of it, a lot of them really don't understand wine very well from a broad perspective, so some of them do. So I, I really like Karen McNeil, she's a good friend. She wrote the Wine Bible and she's traveled all over the world. She has a very objective taste. On the other hand, Robert Parker has become a caricature of himself as far as I'm concerned. I just really don't see that, um, first of all, he has a broad understanding palate. So he understands Cabernet, he understands big tannic wines. but. When we start getting into more finesse things, uh, I don't see an interest in from him to taste through the great wines of, uh, uh, of Greece, for instance, and, and have uh, an objective, clear opinion on that. Jancis Robinson and uh, Hugh Johnson, I respect both of them because they have a staff of really scholarly people who write really great wine books. Um, and I'll leave it at that. So, you know, the point is, don't hang your, your hopes on wine writers like this to come and help build your region. They probably won't. Uh, it doesn't mean you should completely give up on the wine press, but just kind of be careful about who you let in, too, because I remember one of the last wine tours that I was involved with a little bit. I sometimes come along and I help, and, the, and they, they really got the B list on this tour because they had two people. One of them was a was a vegetarian who arrived on, on a bicycle for the tasting, and he was a wine blogger, which, you know, there's no standards for the, a lot of these people. 
In other words, you know, we can't say, okay, let's see your papers, and you know, you can't really figure out, or, is this somebody who's helpful, or, or does anybody even pay attention to them? So it's really important to vet your list, and uh, that's why it's great working with a, a public relations organization that's really good, or, or in your case, you know, you've got the Oregon Wine Board. Hopefully you have somebody who understands the press and has a good relationship with them so that you choose the right people to help you know, present your wines to because you, if you're going to use them for conduit to the outside world, then you want to be sure that it's a good conduit. Okay, so who does count? If you're going to pitch your place, who should you pitch it to if you have a limited budget? And this is what we kind of concluded over the years in Mendocino County. You really want to go to the decision makers and gatekeepers who actually buy wine. That's the other thing that's very weird about the wine press, is here's people who never buy wine. The people uh, are essentially uh, getting wine for free and they're writing in glossy magazines for people who don't trust their own palate. They've got to read to figure out, okay, what should I be drinking instead of going out and drinking it and finding it out for themselves. So who, I, who we found really be helpful are sommeliers putting together psalm tours. They're pretty easy to do. You bring down a group of sommeliers from, from Portland and you have them taste through wines with you and you put them on a good tour and get some interesting speakers and nice places to go. Restaurant buyers are a really important group. They're hard to reach, but uh, we find that putting on uh, wine shows at times when it's convenient for them works well. Of course, the wholesalers, um, they're a controversial lot too. I know somebody who sells a lot of wine directly to customers. He said, uh, I made up my mind early on that I was not going to do business with the mafia or with crooks, and that pretty much eliminated most wine wholesalers. <laughs> so, um, okay, again, uh, do not repeat this. Do not broadcast this. But <laughs> There's some low opinions out there of this industry because of some things that have happened. Professional tastings, whoops, we'll go back just a sec. Professional tastings are something really worth doing uh, as well because they're affordable and you can go to an area uh, and put it on where you have, um, you invite in the Psalms and the, the wine buyers and from different organizations and, and let them taste all in one place. And uh, I, I, we found that to be very, very effective for us. We'll go down to uh, San Francisco and, and rent a nice space, have the professional people in. And then if we want, you can also have a, a consumer organization come. What we'll do is we'll, we'll pair up with a charity. They sell tickets. They, they have their list. They bring us people where they taste wine and we restrict it to a couple hours and it works out pretty well. So we can do dual events that last about four hours, two hours for pros and two hours for the consumers and call it good. Don't forget about us, the land grant universities, okay? So applied research and consultation is really, really valuable, especially for a region like this that's kind of emerging to understand how to grow grapes. I say that it takes at least two generations of grape growers or any perennial crop to really understand it. It's better if we have three or four and uh, the on-campus support in viticulture, enology, plant patho pathology, and entomology is essential because, boy, when you run into a problem, it can just overwhelm you very, very quickly. Right now, we're dealing with a little pest called Virginia creeper leafhopper in Mendocino County. Na Napa's had the uh, European grapevine moth and vine mealybug, and uh, Napa Valley just seems to run from one disaster to the next. And now we have red blotch. Uh, that's really impacting them. It's probably been around, but it seems to be spreading. We don't understand why. So all of these things are really problematic, and you really do need to have a research and development staff on your side, and, and here it is. Support these people, okay? I know we can be annoying at times. We seem like we're not paying attention, but we're really oversubscribed. Uh, plus, we all suffer from attention deficit syndrome because we can't stay focused on things because so, so many things are getting thrown at us right now. But, uh, you know, work with the Cooperative Extension people in Oregon State. They're really your, your, your helpers. And actually, you have a great team here in the state. You know, uh, Patty Skinkus and, and uh, Vaughn Walton, uh, Walt Mahaffey, really good researchers, really helpful. Work with them and support them. And don't let the state take their money away. You guys are farmers. You're paying a huge amount of taxes, especially if you're, you're also involved in the wine industry. What you're asking back from the state is pretty minimal. So this is one thing that's really special to you. Don't let them take them away from you because there's so many other ways to spend money that this is an investment. It's not, it's not uh, just a, you know, another government program. This is an investment in you. So uh, make sure that you, you stay up to snuff on what's going on with their budgets and support them.
We also are third-party neutral informants for press, so we're, we're helpful. I, uh, that's how I get to know wine writers, because I, I uh, see them around uh, at different events. And we also have institutional history. So when somebody like me has been on the job since 1987, um, I've, I've already been working with three generations of wine growers. You know, there's the dead guys, the guys that are about to retire, and, and the young guys. And, uh, you know, there are three separate groups, and they're, they're all important. I should say gals, too. But I was lucky enough to be alive when, uh, be around when John Parducci was alive and some of the other uh, growers, some of the old Italian fellows, and uh, they, they taught me a lot, you know, and I, I've learned a lot from them. And, and that kind of institutional memory uh, doesn't stick around. People forget really, really quickly. So all the young hot shots that are growing, making Pinot Noir in Anderson Valley, who, by the way, came down from Oregon, a lot of them, um, I'm able to kind of keep them on track about, okay, here's what happened back in the days when Pinot Noir sold for $450 a ton and nobody wanted it. Uh, so I can help keep those perspectives. <coughs> wine competitions, you know, they're, they're, again, this is another mixed blessing. The, if you do want to entertain wine writers, this is a very good way to do it. Uh, you know, choose your wine writers carefully. Uh, make sure that they're, A, that they're really writing in the wine press and B, that they have some level of objectivity. So while the, the really high-end guys tend to be a little bit kind of skewed and, and hard to reach, it's sort of the medium-tiered people, uh, a lot of them really are helpful uh, to your region if you put on a good competition. Competitions are, are uh, a little bit pricey, they, but if they're structured well, if you have a competition where you bring in good wine writers, you uh, have them taste through your wine, they give you a lot of valuable feedback, have somebody record notes about what they're tasting, and uh, then have a celebration at the end. So when the wine competition is over, there should be a dinner that uh, you guys attend to find out what happened, and make it a celebration for the previous year's harvest and, and the wines that you released. So wine competitions are something that are worth doing. Uh, they're, as I said, a lot of work, but I think you can get a lot out of them and get some feedback, uh, hopefully objectively, from your wine judges. Wine judges don't have to be just wine writers either. They can also be wine makers from outside of the region. Uh, so they could, you can get very valuable feedback from wine competitions. Visitors are absolutely essential and you already have them here because you've got a lot of nice things to offer them with the coast and on one side and, and uh, Crater Lake on the other and then you have uh, Peter Britt Festival and you have the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. So you're already bringing people into the area. You have logical partners in the restaurants and the hotels. Uh, make sure you beat up your local restaurants if they're not carrying local wine. It's really important that uh, people have a taste of, of the region. Uh, you know, support the restaurant. If they don't have your wine on the list, bring it in and bring a bottle and drink half of it and send the rest back to the hotel or, or the uh, kitchen staff and say, hey, taste this, it's really good. And, uh, you know, always be promoting and pushing. Um, I, it was interesting. I was in Ohio recently, went out to a nice restaurant, and I looked at the wine list, and my neighbor's wine from Paso Robles was on the list, Justin Vineyards, and I'm going, there's not a single Ohio wine on this list. We're in the, in the center of Ohio wine country. What is the meaning of this? This is crazy. And uh, the people were kind of embarrassed, but, you know, they, I chastised them thoroughly for not supporting their, their local wine industry. And I really believe that. People want to drink what's local. That's one of the beauties of, of uh, having local wine available to you is that uh, you have the opportunity to taste it. And people are regionally chauvinistic. They want to drink the wine locally. They'd like it if it's good. You know, They would really like it if it's good. And they'll be damn proud of it if it's, if it's great wine. So uh, you know, that's an incentive for you to, uh, to uh, have good wine on, on hand for, for people to, to drink is something that uh, will just make your region all the better. Tasting rooms are so essential. That's where you meet the world. And if you're a surly, taciturn person, you do not belong in a tasting room. You, <laughs> you belong out on a tractor mowing weeds or something, but do not meet the general public if that describes you. And it's okay to be surly and taciturn. I get that way sometimes too. But um, you, you don't want to be meeting the general public when you're in that kind of mood. So you want to have capable, friendly people who know something about the wine. Uh, it's your face to the world. And you, you can put the glass of wine right in their hand. And this is essential for varietals that are not well known. So if you, if you are making uh, something like Vermentino or, or uh, 
Marsan or Roussan, you know, people aren't going to know what that is. And those wines are delicious, so you want to be sure that you can say, here, taste this. This is something you're not going to get anywhere else. You're not going to get this if you go to, to McMinnville or, or any, Eola or any of those other areas up north. This is something that we do down here that's so different and so good, and you really want to drink it. And our red wines are, are not those kind of like tart, cranberry, light red stuff that you get up north. Our red wines are voluptuous and dark, deep purple. You just want it so much. And um, you know, these are the kinds of things, the messaging that you get to do directly to the customer and get them to taste and enjoy wine. So that's why uh, I think it's important for you to, to uh, <clears throat> have a good tasting room and, and make that experience good. Because they, they may not remember a lot about your region, but they'll remember their experiences they had if they went into a, a wine tasting room and they had a positive experience and they liked the wine and they liked the people who were pouring. Internet and social media, well, this is really the way that the millennials communicate. If you watch them go into a winery, as I have, they've got their smartphones out, they're, they're taking pictures of the label, they're looking it up on the internet to see what kind of scores the wine's got, if they've been scored at all. They're sending pictures to their friends, and this is something that, um, you know, is, is very interesting. My, my daughter, who's a Harvard graduate, is working in business development, and that's what she's doing, is she's developing models that track uh, how people are reacting on the internet to, to different um, products. And uh, she was telling me how um, the King of Thrones TV series, cable series, was created by Netflix looking at what people like to watch and what sort of programs they thought were good. I wonder what the buzzing was. My timer's up. Uh, so Facebook, tweeting, smartphones are used extensively by millennials who are next uh, next generation of, of wine drinkers. And if you're going to do it, do it well. Don't put up a website that you know, has events on it from five years ago. You know, make sure that you, you're updating it and you're constantly putting new information. People are genuinely interested in you. They want to see your winery, your property. They want your philosophy. They want to know how many dogs you have, what their names are. Uh, so it's, it's kind of invasive in a way, but by the same token, it, it puts your face to the outside world and lets people be able to approach and touch you. Uh, even if it's electronic, and, and you'll find that, uh, again, if you're in the wine business and you're selling wine, this is something you want to do is build a following. Good example of that, going back a generation when all they had was print media, is Navarro Vineyards, who I think I put their insignia up there too. They're, they make primarily Pinot Noir and Alsatian varieties and Chardonnay and Anderson Valley. They sell about uh, 60 thousand cases of wine, almost 90% of what they produce, directly out the door at full retail price. And before the days of the internet, they would put out a really fabulous newsletter quarterly. And they had a waiting list to be in their wine club. They didn't have enough wine to be able to, to supply it to everybody. And they, they, <coughs> they still uh, continue to do their newsletter, but they also have a strong web presence as well. And uh, you know that's another um, marketing approach. And I would say for any small winery, you have to get as close as you can directly to your customers. You really have to be able to, uh, to meet them one-on-one -on -one to really be effective. And certainly to get the money that you deserve for your wine, you want to be able to do that. So that's about all I have to say. It's a lot. And uh, you can chalk it up to be in sort of completely random observations uh, to sort of paraphrase statistics. But um, it, it's what I've learned over the years watching uh, a region build itself and the challenges that we've had. You know, when, when I compare us to, uh, to Napa and Sonoma, I had an interesting experience. I, went, I was invited to participate in the Napa Valley Wine Writer Symposium, so I went and, um, you know, Robert Parker was there and, and a bunch of other really impressive people. And we sat down to this totally over-the-top meal after meal and the grand finale was a 2004 tasting of 16 different high-end Napa Valley wines, which sitting in front of me was probably $1,000 worth of wine, and I tasted through them. I'm not a big Cabernet fan, so I didn't like any of them. <laughs> um, there was a few that were good, but most of them you know, were too tannic and too dark, and even after you know, 10 years, they were kind of old. I, I just didn't care for them. But I just was so impressed with what they put together, and everybody was so nice, uh, and everything was done so professionally, 
But I kind of came home and I kind of looked at my Mendocino friends and I said, you know what, I think we just ought to give up now <laughs> because we just, we can't compete with somebody like that and uh, you know, they've got millions to spend on their, their marketing promotion. So that's who you're up against. So my friends said back, yeah, but we don't really want to be those guys. You know, we, we don't want the same visitor experience. We don't want limousines and buses and you're waiting in line for a glass of wine at the tasting bar and you never get to meet the people who made the wine as somebody who's hired and it's all corporate and it's just really weird and that's not really who we want to be. We really want to be kind of genuine and honest and okay, so maybe we won't get $70 a bottle for so-so Cabernet. I mean, maybe we still sell our, our Pinot for $35 a bottle and everybody walks away happy. But it's us, and, and I think that's so important about whatever you decide to do, you really have to be honest about it. You really have to, to relay to people who you are and, and kind of you know, what, what your value proposition is for the wine and why you think it's a good deal. And uh, then do the, the very best you can, which I think this region is capable of doing a very best and making exceptional wine because you've got so much going for you in terms of climate and support and, and uh, the fact that you're here today is a really positive sign and it means you're totally going down the right road and I'm sure that you guys will be every bit as good as Laker Mendocino uh, in, in another few years so uh, I don't think, we're, don't think that you're going to sit still for long so that's all I have to say thank you very much.